thanks everybody for coming out. I'll try to keep it going quickly so we can go get lunch because I know it's all. It's either the talk before lunch, it's really hard, or the talk after lunch when everyone's falling asleep. And those are the two hard ones to give. Um, but I'm Doug Sillers. I'm going to talk today more about following on door is the great talk. I'm going to continue talking about performance, but just a micro look at images and video, which are really important parts of every website and native application. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. A little bit about me. I do freelance developer relations, so I talk to different developers developer communities about things. I also do a lot with performance. So I audit websites, I audit native apps, I run workshops on performance, images and video. I wrote a book about Android apps and if you're interested, that's the PDF so you can download it. I'll post the slides on my Twitter uh, later today. Um, so feel free to download it and take a look. And then if you ever have any questions about performance, and how to speed up your website or your app, I'm the only Doug Sillers on the internet. So I'm really easy to find. Um, and so before we start thinking in, in, um, about performance, how many of you, when you think about this walkway that's nailed into the side of an out in Switzerland, do you get a little nervous thinking about walking across it? Anyone? I see some nods, right? Um, it's literally nailed into the side of an out. And when we walked across it, my six-year-old daughter decided to jump across the whole thing. So it had this nice rattling effect that was really, that added a lot to it. Um, but Ericsson did a study a few years ago where they put sensors on people's heads to measure stress responses to different objects, to different stimuli, and they found that queuing in line was a little bit stressful. They found for a lot of people, thinking about standing on the edge of a cliff is extremely stressful. But they actually found that experiencing mobile delays is more stressful than standing on the edge of a cliff. And so if you're building a slow experience, <laughs> your customers are feeling stressed out when they're trying to load that page. And if they're stressed out, they're less likely to continue using your, your content. They're less likely to buy things, right? You want your customers to be happy. When people are happy, they buy more things. So continuing down that performance idea, Google found that a three second delay on a mobile site causes 53% of your users to abandon. Another study found that half a second delay increases frustration and lowers engagement. Walmart and Amazon almost 20 years ago on the desktop found that 100 milliseconds causes a 1% drop in revenue. And obviously for them, that's tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, but for everybody, 1% of revenue is a lot. And then my favorite step of all is 4% of mobile users admit to throwing their phone when there's a slow experience. So what can we do to speed up the content? We just saw a great talk on how to speed up JavaScript and microservices and all that great stuff. But if you look at the HTTP archive, images and video make up 75% of the average web page. So if we can optimize the images and video that show up on our web pages, if they can download faster, that page is gonna show up on the screen a lot faster. So you can see that images are half, you can see video is about 25%. Most web pages don't have video, but this is sort of like the law of averages. The sites that do have video skew the average so much just like if Jeff Bezos came in and sat down, our average salary in this room would be $200 million a year each. Um, just the one website throws off that average by a great deal. So what can we do to optimize images and video? It can be really, really expensive. Um, Laura showed the, what is it? How is my site? How, how it's, what is my site cost.com? And, you know, this web page that I just showed, you know, the average web page, mobile web page is 3.1 megabytes. And so what does my site cost? Well, if I were roaming on my Irish SIM in Russia, it's 10 euros a megabyte. So that means that the FT would have cost me about 10, euro, 10 euros to load. But uh, this, the, the average page here would be 31 euros to load, right? That's crazy. So, you know, one, always make sure when you're traveling, like what your roaming package is, because that's nuts. I thought my roaming is turned off here because, Dad, why are we, why are we eating this month? Um, right? So, and images are really, really big and expensive. This is uh, Porto in, in uh, Portugal. And I took this with my phone and it's eight megabytes. So this is 80 euros, right? <laughs> one picture. Um, but images are really, it depends on like what kind of colors you have. I mean, this is obviously a very vibrant picture. There's a lot of color, there's a lot going on. 
With that same camera, I was in Oslo a week later, and this photo only is three and a half megabytes because it's basically grayscale, even though it is a color photo. Um, I'm not making fun of Oslo here. I'm from Seattle originally, and this is what Seattle looks like for nine months out of the year. Um, but as you can see, like just, just small changes can really change the way the image looks. Um, so what can we do to optimize images? We learned about Lighthouse in the last talk, and Lighthouse is a great tool to monitor and to audit how your web page loads. And inside Lighthouse, there's four image optimizations. Those are quality, format, sizing, and lazy loading. And when you run the audit against your web page, it gets scored up from zero to 100. So let's look to see what we can do to optimize these things. And so what I did to study how the web is going today is I used web page test which if you're not using web page test on your, on your websites, you should, because it's the best tool out there to really figure, to look at performance. And it's free and it's open source. Um, and built on top of the web page test is a tool called the HTTP archive. And every two weeks, they look at 1.2 million desktop sites, 1.2 million mobile sites, and they take all the web page test data and all the Lighthouse data and they put it into BigQuery which allows you to then study what the, the status of the web today, what's on the web today. And so what I did is I took half a million websites with Lighthouse data, and I'm looking at these formats to see what's out there on the web today. What are people doing? <coughs> so when you test with Lighthouse for image quality, Lighthouse recommends that you save all your images at 85% quality. When you lower the quality, you're actually removing pixels. You're lowering the pixel resolution, the, you know, what inside the image. Um, but Google has found that 85% is generally good enough. And there are a lot of tools that will do that. You can use Image Magic. Just take your image, save it at quality 85, and you get a magical image that comes out. You can use a cloud-based tool like Cloudinary, where you upload the full-size image, and then you just add the term Q85, and it on the fly will generate a quality 85% image for you. And when I do that, here's the original image. This is Riga. Riga Latvia, and this image was 3.6 megabytes. If I save it at 85% quality, it's half the size, right? From, from 36 euros to uh, 18 and a half euros, right? Still a lot, but it's gonna be a lot faster. I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's half the size. It's gonna download a lot faster. If we look at what's happening on the web today, how many websites are using quality 85 in the images that they're serving? we actually find that 43% are getting 100%. They're doing the right thing. But a third of the internet, 33% of the internet are scoring a zero. They're not optimizing their images at all for quality. And in the Lighthouse data, it tells you how much faster your site would be if you did this optimization. And they found that the me in, in the data that I have, the median site that scored a zero would be 2.8 seconds faster on 3G on mobile. So if you can speed up your page by almost three seconds, that's pretty crazy. And you would save 420 kilobytes less data. So that's a pretty fast optimization just by changing your images to quality 85. But can you go better than that? Like that's just quality 85. What if you did quality 50? Right now we're down we're again, half the size. If you look really closely, there's some kerning and stuff at the, at the inner, you know, where the roof lines are. Um, when you go to quality 20, it's really obvious, right? You can see all the different, you know, the, the different banding in the sky. And it's a really, it, it's not as pretty an image. You would never want to put that on the web. So we know that it's good there, according to Google. We know it's bad visually there. Um, but where's that sweet spot in the middle? And wouldn't it be cool if there was automated tools that could tell us if there were, were the sweet spot in the middle, if we could go lower than 85%? And there are tools that will do this for us. Um, Google's tool is called Buder Outly. The Google compression engineers all live in Switzerland and they name all their compression algorithms after, after um, pastries. So Buder Outly is a type of pastry. Uh, structural similarity is another uh, tool that's out there. And I use two tools here. One is it's called CJPEG DSSIM. It's an open source tool. It creates a, the, it finds that sweet spot right in the middle where the, where, uh, so what structural similarity does is it says, it goes to the limit of the eye. So it lowers the quality until the human eye can see a difference. And so it, it takes it lower than 85 generally and saves you more data. Uh, so CJPEG DSSIM is a tool. Again, Cloudinary has a Q auto that finds that for you automatically. And when I do that, I went from 1.87 to 1.46. So I saved 400K 
for an image that no one can tell that I've lowered the quality. So this is a great way to optimize your image just a little bit further. And you can see, you know, on my graph, I saved another 400 kilobytes. So that's really awesome. Well, what does that look like in real life? I can load these web images into web page test. I can test them here. I'm testing in Virginia because in Virginia, they have real Motorola and uh, real Android and iOS devices. So I'm testing on a Motorola G4. I'm using a 3G connection. And you can see that the full image takes 21 seconds to load. And as soon as I do structural similarity, it's half at 9.5 seconds. So I'm really speeding up the delivery of these images. It went from 3.7 megabytes to 1.5 megabytes. So we're really making a big improvement here, but we can do better. So let's go to the second optimization that shows up in Lighthouse and that's image format. If we look at the different image formats out there, this is again, HTTP archive data. What's the average size? JPEGs are generally the largest. The average size is about 47 kilobytes. Um, let's look at SVGs, which are vector graphics. These are great if you're just doing icons or very simple images. And so a scalable vector graphic are images drawn as shapes. They're infinitely scalable and you write them in XML or the, the output is XML. So they're text files and you can stretch them. So this is the same SVG and it looks pixelated. And that's only because PowerPoint doesn't support SVGs and I had to paste screenshots in. Um, but you know, it looks great at any size but you can mess up SVGs. And here's an example of a site in Brazil where they built this beautiful SVG of the Facebook icon and they built it in Illustrator. And the reason I know they built it in Illustrator is that there's metadata in there that tells me they built it in Illustrator. And um, unfortunately, when you build an SVG in Illustrator, it adds a lot of metadata. It adds about 1.3 megabytes of metadata to, to your SVG file. Um, and so I opened up the XML and I deleted all of that and it was 900 bytes. That's like 99, I don't know how many nines that is, but it's a lot, 99.999% smaller. Of course, it's an XML file, so you can gzip it or use Brotly um, to make it even smaller. Um, so I guess the moral of this story is SVGs are great. They're very small, they're infinitely scalable, but if you use them, make sure that you test it before you push it to production. This website had five and a half megabytes of SVG files. This should have probably been about two kilobytes. And that's, that's pretty um, insane. But when we're talking about uh, raster formats like JPEG, if you look at the average WebP, it's about half the size. And so WebP, JPEG is 26 years old. It just celebrated its 26th birthday last month. Um, and WebP is only about seven or eight years old. So it's a newer algorithm. It has better compression. So why aren't more people using it? And the first thing that everyone says is, well, it isn't supported. And I've had to update this slide almost weekly for the last month because it keeps changing. We just got support in Edge. Um, earlier this summer, I could say it was just a Google format because it was only Chrome and Android, but now it's in Edge. Um, and I could always say, well, they're working on it in Firefox and Safari. Um, because it got supported in Edge on October 2nd, according to this tweet. Um, but if you look now, it's in Firefox too. And so this is November 13th, like this is just less than two weeks ago. Um, you can now see that it's supported in Firefox as well. So now we're getting into almost every modern browser is supporting WebP. Um, it's looking a lot, there's a lot more green um, than there is red. We're still missing a few critical browsers. Um, but when I save this image as WebP, it goes from 1.4 megabytes now to under a megabyte, right? So if I do all the structural similarity, I do all the WebP, we're now under a megabyte. And, you know, because it doesn't have the full support, you can use the picture tag and you can serve the WebP first. If the browser doesn't know what to do with the WebP, it'll fall back on the JPEG. But you can see my WebP image is now, is about two and a half seconds faster than that optimized JPEG. So we've, you know, we've done a lot to speed up this image. If we look at what's out there, very few websites are doing alternative image formats. In fact, two thirds of the internet completely fail at this. Um, and now that WebP support is really out there, there's not as many excuses to not do this. Um, if you look at the median site on, um, on 3G, you would save 4.1 seconds on load time and about 600 kilobytes of data. Like we're talking about a very significant uh, speed up just by changing your images to WebP. Third optimization is sizing. 
And this is sort of responsive images. So the idea here is I took this picture of a cathedral in Novi Sad, um, and the original image is 13 megapixels. It's 1.6 megabytes. I do all the optimizations we just talked about. I get it down to 800 kilobytes. Um, but it's still 13 megapixels. And so what happens when you download 13 megapixels on a small phone, right? All of a sudden, you download 13 megapixels. It only displays 500,000. And it has the, the CPU has to fire up and throw away 12.5 million pixels before it can show up on the screen. So if you're on a low powered phone, that CPU can actually take a long time. I ran a test with a similar image like this on a um, Android Go device. It took 800 milliseconds post download for the CPU to process the image. So you're adding, in addition to the tax of downloading it, there's a tax of reprocessing the image here. And in, in, the, in the UK and, um, and in the US, when you buy something from Amazon, often you, you get this giant box and you open it up and you have to pull out like 12 meters of brown paper. And then you find out there's a pencil in the bottom of the box. And so what we're doing, you know, when you send down a giant image and then you only show just a little tiny bit, it's just as wasteful as this giant box being sent halfway across America to only find a pencil in the bottom, right? They could have just wrapped it in an envelope and it would have been a lot faster, a lot more efficient packaging. But this is a very tricky problem because if you look at the number of devices that are out there, there are a lot of mobile devices out there. These are just the Android devices uh, that hit Akamai in, in one day. The size of the box is how many of each device there are. So these are all like Samsung devices. And the color of the box is how fast the processor is. So if you have a device with a very small screen and a very slow processor, you kind of get that double taxation of having to download the huge file and then waiting a long time for the image to show up on the screen. So how do you optimize for all of these different devices? The trick is responsive images. This has been around for a while. The idea is you generate a set of images, and one theory is make them all 25 kilobytes apart. That could generate a lot of images. Maybe you only want to have three, like a small, medium, large. You can decide that based on the analytics of this device sizes that come into your website or you made a app. So in this case, I generated a whole bunch of different images, and the image that shows up is 625,000 pixels, so I'm only throwing away 100,000 pixels this time. That's a lot more efficient. The tool I used, um, you can, there are a lot of tools that do this. You can integrate them into your content management system so that they're generated on the fly. A new image comes in, you generate all the different sizes. Um, this is a web-based tool where I say, give me a bunch of images between 200 pixels wide to 1400 pixels wide that are 25 kilobytes apart. And I get code that looks like this. And you can see they're all on Cloudinary and for a different width, I get different size images. But let's do the demo because it's cooler to look at the web page than to look at code. So this is the web page, a little bigger. And as I shrink down the size, it loads the correctly sized image. They're all 25 kilobytes apart. And so when I go, as soon as I find that first breakpoint, oops, all right, there, there are a few missing and I'm not on the Wi-Fi. All right. But you can see when you go, there's not a lot, these images, you know, 25 kilobytes, you don't have to resize the image a lot to get to save 25 kilobytes. But if we go all the way down to the bottom, this image is perfectly sized for a very small screen or for a thumbnail, and it's like 25 kilobytes. But when you go really, 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 really big, right, this image is 200 kilobytes and it's perfectly sized for this large screen. And so it, it jumps between the sepia back and forth. You can actually see this. Let's see if I can do the little mouse thing. Does that work? Yeah, there it is. You can see every other image is list. I have it making it sepia as well, which is kind of cool. Um, but this is the huge savings because I just removed millions of pixels from these images. And so now the load time goes from seven seconds to two seconds because it's not a megabyte, it's 121 kilobytes. So by removing all of that data, this, page, this image is now loading. This is actually pretty reasonable for a mobile web page. We're down to, I guess it's still costing me a euro. <laughs> Um, but, you know, that's a lot better than what it was costing me earlier. Um, this is much more supported on the internet today. Almost 60% of the internet is doing this today. 22% are not. For those sites that are not doing any responsive image uh, optimization, the median web page would be two and a half seconds faster on 3G and would be 400 kilobytes less data. 
So the first three optimizations are all optimizations that you do on specific images. The last optimization is lazy loading. And lazy loading, the idea behind lazy loading is if I have this web page here, only two of the images show up at load time. Um, what if I didn't show those four images that were at the bottom of the page? Right? This page is going to load up and then just have JavaScript in place to have those images appear when the page loads up, when, when somebody scrolls through the page. Um, according to the HTTP archive, 22% of the web is doing lazy loading properly, but 60% are not. Lazy loading could speed up that initial load time. So what's happening is you're saving that initial load time, they load up later. Uh, it's three and a half seconds faster on 3G, 500 kilobytes less data. And the way a lot of websites are doing this today, Medium does this, Facebook does this, um, Google Image Search does this. So if you search for cats in costume, you get these placeholder images with the color that represents the image that's going to show up later. So the cat that's dressed up like a dinosaur gets a green, the cat dressed up like a bunny gets pink. And so these are just simple SVG squares that are very small, they're probably like 300 bytes. And so it doesn't cost you anything. And the customers now know that an image will fill this spot. So you don't get any of the reflows of the web page, which are really nice as well. If you want to go a little fancier, you can build SVGs that have a few more resources as opposed to just one color. This is an open source tool called Squib, and it takes my waterfall picture, and you can see instead of just being green, it sort of has a representation of some of the other colors that are there. Um, so today, to do lazy loading, you need to add a JavaScript you know, that looks for the, where the customer is on the page, maybe using the intersection observer, and then loads those images for you. However, what's really cool is Chrome is working to do this in the browser, where the browser does this for us. So this is a web page, and I've just zoomed it way out. This is a desktop page, and I've tried to show each viewport. And so if you look at the top, there's four images in that first viewport when the page loads. But if you load it in Chrome today, you start off with just the text, and you can see the text reflowing as I go down. But what's really interesting, Oh, see, now it's catching up. There we go. So you can see here that, you know, images that are below the fold start loading in earlier than the images up here at the top. And really, it makes more sense to have the images up here load before this image of the cow way down here, right? We don't need the cow. We want this image right here so that our customers see that full experience as quickly as possible. They're not scrolling. Um, inside Chrome, behind a flag today, you can get something that looks more like this. And so what Chrome is doing is they take the first two kilobytes of every image, and then the first two kilobytes, they get the dimensions. They know the size of each one of these images and where they are on the page. So you can see by number three here, the entire page is laid out. And I'm using placeholder image, you know, I'm using the squib, so you can see the squib placeholder images loaded in place. But then what's also really cool is now Chrome knows where the images are on the screen. We're not going to get any more reflows. You can see the text is completely laid out. But it also is loading the images in order from top to bottom. So the images at the top appear first, and the images in the middle appear second, and then the images at the bottom appear last. This makes a lot more sense, right? Have the browser do this, it will fix it for every single web page. And so this is coming really soon to a browser near you, which I'm really excited about. That goes through the four optimizations that are in Lighthouse, but there's a lot more we can talk about. Let's talk a little bit about animated GIFs. So this is Nora. This is my goat back in Seattle. Um, I took a video of Nora, and the original video on my phone was 1.4 megabytes. And I thought, well, you know what the internet needs? You know what the internet needs. Yeah, goat GIFs. Too many cats, we need more goat GIFs. So there's Nora, she's eating a leaf. And when I make this into an animated GIF, it gets bigger. It's 3.8 megabytes, and that's insane. Um, so why does that happen? And the reason it happens is that GIFs are actually older than JPEGs. GIFs are from the 1980s. And if you read the original spec for GIF, it says, we have an animated format. We don't recommend that anybody uses it. Um, yeah, that's sort of, that ship has sailed a little bit. And the reason the compression is so bad is that animated GIFs are actually a flipbook of individual GIF images. So if you go at 15 frames per second, there are 15 GIFs that, the, that it's just flipping through. So you can see all the, the pictures of Nora here. 
Um, but what can I do to optimize this? Well, GIFs are 256 colors. I made an MP4 where I stripped out the thousands of colors that my phone put in there. I stripped out the audio track because GIFs are silent. So that's an easy way to save a few kilobytes there. And this video is now 250, 250 kilobytes, which is a huge savings. And I can pop it into the video tag. So when you use the video tag, you have to say loop autoplay. You have to add plays in line for Safari so that it plays automatically. You notice I have muted. And you're like, well, it's a silent video. It's muted anyway. But to play on a video to autoplay on mobile Chrome and mobile Safari, you have to put it as muted. And that's so that when you're sitting in class or you're sitting in, in a meeting and you're browsing on your phone when you're not supposed to be, people won't hear that video being really, really loud and you won't be embarrassed. So that's why video has to be muted on mobile devices uh, for it to autoplay. So this will actually work. It'll play the GOAT video and it'll be great. But video is always the last thing to load on a web page. Browsers know that uh, video is really expensive in terms of kilobytes and it takes a long time. So they want to make sure the JavaScript, the CSS, everything else loads up first. But in Safari, you can actually put a video into the picture tag. So in this case, you can put the video in the picture tag, you can put an animated WebP into the picture tag, and then you can have the fallback to the GOAT, to the animated GIF. And why this is really cool is your Safari customers get that image in four and a half seconds on 3G because it's only 250 kilobytes. Whereas anyone who has to wait for the animated GIF has to wait 22 seconds for it to load. So this is a huge performance improvement. I expect video in the picture tag is gonna come across more browsers very, very soon just for the same performance reason. That's a nice segue to talk about video. What can we do to optimize video on the internet today? Um, when video is slow or video doesn't start, customers get angry. And as we all know, when customers get angry, they throw their mobile phones. So um, what are the metrics that people use to follow video that make people angry? And the first metric is, does the video start? The second one is, did the video stall? We all know that when a video stalls during playback, that's really annoying. And then the third metric is, does the video look good? Did it, did it, did it have an appropriate quality while it was playing on the phone? And there was a great study that came out. There's an analytics company called Conviva, and they study um, video streaming. It's one of the top video streaming analytics companies. And in Q1 of this year, they found that four, almost 14% of all videos never started playback. So imagine if we built a web page that didn't load 14% of the time, or if we had an app that crashed 14% of the time, but mobile vi video fails to play 14% of the time. So what's going on here? What can we do to figure out what's going on? It turns out that 2.4 billion videos didn't play in Q1 of this year alone. I mean, that's a crazy number of videos. It's about 800 video, million hours of video playback. And so let's walk through some of the reasons. So 400 million videos failed to start when you pressed play. And there are a few 404s, there are 500 errors, right? Things that you might expect, but it's not the full amount. So I think the biggest reason video fails to play back is stuff like this, where you press the button and then you don't have authorization to watch it in your country, right? Oops, it doesn't work in your country. And so this was a CBS video from America. And when I loaded it, it took 230 requests and 3.1 megabytes to tell me, oops. When I go to the Amazon application, there's an Amazon video application. And when I fire it up, um, when I'm not in the States, it says, oh, you're not in the States. Here are all the TV shows that you can watch when you get back home because we don't have the rights to show it in Russia or in, in, in the UK or in Germany. But here are the videos you can watch while you're traveling. And that saves me that click of getting the oops, right? Which is disappointing. And I don't think, I think Amazon doesn't want people to be disappointed, right? They want people to find the content and watch it rather than to get like, well, this app doesn't have any of the videos I want to watch. They tell me why it can't be played and then give me other options so I can move on. But what about the 11.5% of videos that people gave up on? Two million views, two billion views, excuse me, where someone pressed play and then they gave up. 
So what's going on there? Another study found that once you press play, everyone waits two seconds. They'll wait two seconds for that video to start up. And then after that, you lose 6% of your customers every additional second. So the longer it takes for the video to start up, the more people you're going to lose. It depends on the type of video you're going to watch. So if you're watching, the red line here is a long play video. So if you're watching a TV show or you're watching a movie, you've already said, I'm going to sit here for an hour. You'll wait another 10 seconds. But if you're watching a video of a cat dressed up like a shark, sitting on a Roomba, chasing a duck, after about three seconds, you're like, what? And you start moving on with your life and you give up because you don't really care that much about this video. So people give up on short play videos a lot faster than long play videos. So what can we do to get the video there faster? This is an example of a native application that I'm testing with a tool called Video Optimizer. And what we're doing is we're looking at all the packets. So this, this gray set of packets right here with the big red point, that's an ad being downloaded, right? So they watching a movie, an ad has to be downloaded. The brown are all the packets. And then from time 80 to time 105, the ad's playing back. So you've got to watch a 30 second ad before you can watch the TV show. And then at time 107, the ad is done, and the, the, they're like, oh yeah, they want to watch the TV show, so they start downloading the TV show. The problem is, of course, you end up waiting for about 10 seconds after the ad before the video can play. You get a spinner, right? If there's nothing happening on the network, why don't you download the video while the ad is playing back? You've got 15 seconds to download the video, and then as soon as the ad is done, you immediately go into the video, which is going to make your customers a lot happier rather than they have to wait, they have to watch an ad, and then they have to wait, and then they have to watch the TV show. If you can take out some of those waits, you're going to make your customers a lot happier. So if someone's going to watch the video, preload it as fast as you can so that it's on the device when they're watching it. However, you need to be careful with preload. In HTML, inside the video tag, you can set preload equals auto. And what that does is it automatically downloads the entire video, whether or not the person presses play or not. So this is some company's homepage, and they set preload equals auto on, on the page. And so you can see it's downloading the entire video at the end of the uh, web page test waterfall. And that ends up being 23.6 megabytes of data that's being downloaded, whether or not you press play. So like, if I'm roaming in Russia, you know, that's the food budget <laughs> for, the, for a long time, you know, 236, uh, <clears throat> 236 euros. Um, but it's also extremely expensive for the company. Can you imagine every single time somebody hits this web page, they're downloading 23 and a half megabytes of video that probably nobody's watching? That's got to be extremely expensive from CDN and, and backend server costs. So do this if you know they're going to watch the video, but don't do it if people aren't going to watch the video. Um, there's a lot of talk about background video where people say that websites that have background video really get more engagement. People spend more time on the website. Um, it's mostly marketing companies telling you to do that. But this is a, a website that, you know, I want to take my kids here because it looks like these kids are having a lot of fun. Um, and it really gets you thinking about, you know, you can really see what's going on more than a picture can, I guess. Um, but there are ways we can optimize these images that are playing in the background. Um, this video, when I download, is 5.3 megabytes, which isn't that bad for a video, but we can get smaller. One thing that I noticed with this video is it actually has an audio track, but the video is silent. So if you can remove 5% of the file just by stripping off the audio track before you launch it, you're gonna make that, get that file download a lot faster. So a best practice is if the video is silent, whether it's like an animated GIF or it's a background video, just remove the audio stream. It's really easy to do with tools like FFmpeg just to strip out the audio stream. Um, the other thing that you should look at is this is the waterfall diagram for that same web page on mobile. And these are the, that's the video downloading, it's in green. The problem is their CSS actually blocks the video for certain screen sizes. And so on my device, I got a placeholder image, but it still downloaded the entire video onto my phone. And so of course, if the viewport isn't gonna support the video, don't download it. I see this on a lot of mobile web pages 
where you see the video being downloaded in web page test or Chrome DevTools, but it never shows up on the screen. Here's another website with a background video, and this is the classic, it works on my machine. I'm sure the devs say this works great on my machine, but it doesn't work for anyone else. If you sit on this page for about 30 seconds on a really fast, uh, you know, Wi-Fi connection, you might see the background video on this web page. So let's look at the background video. This is the background video. It's 33.6 megabytes. It's 27 seconds long. It's 2,500 pixels wide by 1,200 pixels tall. And it's being downloaded at 10 megabits per second. So resize that video to something that's reasonable for a desktop or even for a mobile device, because this does go to the mobile device as well. Um, and it never plays. If you look at the Chrome DevTools for this website, it looks like they tried to rename the file to 720p, but they didn't actually re-encode the video. So the second tip is renaming the file doesn't actually re-encode the video. <laughs> you should re-encode the video. Um, they did rename it to new, so it is a new video. But, you know, like, you start seeing really strange things when you start finding these edge cases on the internet. Um, when I resized it, if I save it as uh, 1080p, it's 8.1 megabytes, right? I've made it three times smaller just by resizing the, in, the video. You could even go smaller. Maybe you just need like the 720p and you can send out a 4.3 megabyte file. Your customers might actually see it too versus a 33 megabyte uh, video. So, you know, think about, you know, when you resize these videos, you actually save a lot of data. So look at that and maybe sort of different sizes to mobile to desktop. When I started talking about video, people just said, well, why don't I just stick it up on YouTube? Then I don't have to worry about any of this. But you do have to worry about something else. Um, if you put it into YouTube, you get 700 to 1 megabyte of additional JavaScript on your web page because that's what they add to make sure that it can play the video for you. Um, so if you want to do this, this is a totally viable option, but audit it. Make sure that it isn't killing performance in other ways because you've added a lot of JavaScript to your page. Um, does anyone here watch TED Talks? I see a couple nods, right? There's a lot of great information out there on TED Talks, and I love sharing TED Talks, and there's a share button, and you get one line of code. That's so easy, like adding one line of code to your web page. It's just one line of code, right? Um, 118 requests, 32 megabytes transferred. <laughs> it streams the entire thing in the background, whether or not you want it to stream in the background or not. This is desktop. It is um, adaptive bitrate streaming, so if you do it on a slower connection, it'll be a lower number of megabytes because it'll pick the right stream for your device, but it automatically downloads the entire video on page load. So when you do things like this, you should audit what's happening to your web page because like, that, it's just one line of code can be very, very dangerous sometimes. But what, how does video streaming work? What's going on here? So when you have a video stream, you have a bunch of different bit rates and you have a player, and so you tell the player with a manifest file, here are all the different bit rates that I have. There are these different width and height, and they, you know, you get all this information about each bit rate. The player chooses a stream, it starts collecting a bunch of segments, and each segment, it depends on the way you built your stream, but it's usually two seconds or four seconds, or maybe even 10 seconds of video. And so it can play each one of those sequentially. And it starts downloading all these segments, and then it starts playback. And so the idea is you quickly start playing the video, and then once the video is playing, the player gets an idea of the throughput on the network because it knows how big the files are, it knows how fast it took them to come down. It can then target the right bit rate for that device and optimize the bit rate. And so you've probably seen this where you're watching a video and the first few seconds are really pixelated and like they don't look very good. And then three or four seconds, it gets sharp into a really nice looking video stream. And what they're doing is they're downloading the lowest quality bit rate at the beginning. And the reason you do the lowest quality bit rate at the beginning is those are small files. They download faster. The video starts very, very quickly. So you get the fast video startup, even if the quality isn't very good. And then eventually it'll find the right bit rate and give you a good quality video, four or five seconds into the video. But this is what a manifest file looks like. You've got video tracks. You have video tracks inside the iframe, inside iframes. I don't know why they're separate, but that's the way the spec is built. And then these are the audio tracks and all of the subtitles. And so this TED Talk, um, I'm sure it has Russian because it has 
every other language out there. I can't see it right now, but I'm, uh, but I see Bulgarian, Ukrainian, French Canadian, and regular Canadian, Polish. I'm sure it's okay. I'm not seeing it. All right. Uh, but let's look at the video tracks because that's what, what, where most of the data is. And so what you can see here is there's, let's see if I can do the little pointer thing. Does that work? All right. So you can see, there's the audio stream it wants to download. You can see the, um, the bit rate, 1.4 megabits per second. You can see the codec. You can see the resolution. And then this is where all the files are. And so what a player does is it always picks the first bit rate because it has to start somewhere. So it's going to start here at 1.4 megabits per second. Um, what happens if that stream is too high for the device or the network that you're on? What if you can't sustain 1.4 megabits per second? The video is trying to download the video, but it's taking too long. And the player knows that if it takes too long, your customers are going to give up and the video isn't going to play. So it quickly switches to a lower bit rate. Once it switches to a lower bit rate, the buffer fills up and the video plays, but we just added an extra step. So for that reason, a lot of people start with lower bit rates, because if you added that extra step, you just added two or three seconds to the video playback. And we come back to this slide where 11 and a half percent of our customers abandon after you press play. So this is a huge way that you lose some of your customers. So to optimize the startup time, this is what I was explaining earlier. Most companies, most start with the lowest bit rate and then three seconds in, it'll find the optimal bit rate. In this case, I'm calling it stream four. When you start with too high a bit rate, the video can't play. The player switches to the lowest bit rate, and then you end up at that good bit rate. But adding that extra step adds sometimes two to five seconds of time, and you lose customers. There's a different approach. I call this the Goldilocks approach, where it's not too small, not too big, where they just start with a medium-sized bit rate, and it just sits there automatically. And this is what Amazon does, because Amazon knows, remember, if the video is a longer play video, you'll hang out for a little bit longer. All of Amazon's videos are half an hour, an hour, two hours long. They know you're going to hang out for a few more seconds. And so the video starts, it never starts with a black screen on Amazon. It always goes to like the actual picture of the movie because it's always super sharp. And so that's how they differentiate themselves from other uh, video streaming companies. And we can actually put these into web page tests and we can see what it looks like. You can see that the, when you start with the lowest quality bit rate, the video appears first. When you start at the highest bit rate, it comes up way over here, but the quality is exactly the same as at 11 because it tried to download the high quality, it didn't work. And so at 17 seconds, it just took six seconds longer for the same quality video to show up. And then here in the middle, This technology when I can just use my hand. All right. Um, this is a higher quality video. It took a couple seconds longer, but it's higher quality. So that might work for um, um, for uh, if you're playing longer play videos. It's something to look at testing when you're uh, you know building these things. When you start with the highest quality video on fast connection, it's going to look awesome. So this is sort of, again, it looks great on my machine when I test it in the office on my gigabit fiber internet. Um, but for everybody else, this might not look very good and it's going to take a long time for it to start up. When you start with the lowest quality video, that initial quality is low, but it's fast. So that's a good, it's a trade-off that you have to look at to see if it's the right trade-off. And then, you know, the Amazon approach where the quality is good, but it takes a little bit longer. It might be worthwhile testing for the way you, you build your video streaming services. Um, but let's look at one more example of how I optimized a video streaming service. This is the bit rates um, for a talk, for a TED talk that I was looking at. And when I was testing it on a 3G connection, what I noticed is it went to this lowest bit rate, the 64K bit rate, and never recovered. And the quality of the video, the audio was fine, but the quality of the video was extremely low while I was watching this video. And I couldn't figure out why. Because the network I was using should have been able to handle this bit rate right here, 1.4 megabits per second. But then I noticed even if you look, the 1.4 megabit per second bit rate is actually being streamed at 600 kilobits per second. They're overstating the bit rate to avoid a stall. So it down, the buffer fills up twice as fast as the player expects it will because the, the player is expecting it to come in at 1.4 and it's coming in at 600, at half that. 
So I went and I changed all the numbers to match what the actual bit rates were. I modified the manifest file. The first thing you notice is that the, the y-axis is going to change, right? I made them all half the size of it. The size they actually are is what's being reported. And when I ran the test, it still dropped to the lowest bit rate, but it very quickly recovered to the 600. So that's great, right? We're getting better quality video, maybe five or six seconds into the video. So that first, again, the first five or six seconds are still pretty pixelated. And I wanted to do better. I wanted to see what was really going on. And so I actually went to the next level manifest file. And so this is actually where it's calling each video segment. And in each video segment, it lists the length of the file. So this is this one's 5.04 seconds, 6.7 seconds, 0.12 seconds. But the length, the byte ranges, didn't match, right? This one is only like 30 kilobytes, but it's six seconds long, or this one's almost a megabyte, but it's five seconds. Like the numbers didn't quite work out. And so I played with the math a little bit and I couldn't get it to work right. So finally I said, screw it. We're just gonna download the first three segments as one file without a byte range. And it's 11.95 seconds long. We'll just download it like that and we'll see what happens. And when I ran the test, it stayed at this awesome 600K stream. And then quickly, by the time the TED Talk started up, jumped up to 950 kilobits per second. So I really improved the quality of the video that was showing up on the screen. Now, I took it to the other extreme where it'll probably stall more often versus never stalling and being really low quality. But I'm sure there's a sweet spot in the middle where we can find a good balance to keep the video looking good, but not stalling. So in conclusion, we've talked a lot about a lot of different things. We can optimize images by the quality, the format, the sizing, and we can lazy load images if possible. And from the video perspective, only download the video when it's showing up on the screen, strip out the audio if it's silent, uh, resize videos for mobile, audit your third parties. This is probably a good thing for everything, not just video. Um, and then with streaming, start with lower bit rates to speed up video playback, and then conservative bit rates could reduce stalls, but it will also lower your quality. So there's some trade-offs that you can make there to make your video look good. Um, the tooling I used for this, I used web page test the HTTP archive, some tools for uh, images that I used. And in conclusion, um, images and video can be fast and beautiful at the same time. So with that, thank you very much. I'll be happy to talk. Thank you. I think we have time for one question and one for answer. So, uh, let me talk about uh, images. So, you mentioned that uh, JPEG uh, will be bigger and WebP is smaller. Mm -hmm. And as I told, JPEG is based on uh, this kind of transformation. You have square 8 to 8, uh, you have uh, wave coefficients, and it's very easy to recalculate it back, uh, especially on our architecture, which we have on Google and Fox. Okay. Uh, talking on WebP, I never recall it, but I Google it in background. It has the same algorithm, but based on motion vectors like PNP frame in video streams. Right. So it's mathematically much more difficult to uh, recalculate it back because right. you need to compare all uh, remaining sets. And what about CPU performance? Uh, will images be translated uh, from uh, raw stream to image faster? What is uh, this policy? In <clears throat> so when I looked, um, displaying them on the screen on both mobile and on desktop. Um, it was about the same for both JPEG and for WebP. I was testing Chrome um, on Android devices and it seemed to be about the same. Um, you know, within 10, 20 milliseconds, like at that point, like there's error and I, I wasn't as scientific as I could have been to pre prevent that sort of error. So from what I can see is the decoding on the device is about the same. Um, there are some other things you could do with JPEGs that may make them faster, even though they're larger, like doing progressive JPEGs, where it starts off with not all of the data and it sharpens as more data downloads. So there is still some controversy in the image community, like are progressive JPEGs better than WebP? Um, you know, your mileage may vary, it's worth testing. Um, a lot of people are now saying to do progressive JPEGs above the fold because they will load the whole image and then sharpen, whereas WebP is only top to bottom because it's a video format. Uh, WebP is actually from the VP8 video format. It's essentially, to some degree, it's a one frame VP8 video. Yes, it's in here. Yeah. Okay. Previews. Oh. Any questions?
That's fine. Everyone wants to go to lunch. <laughs> Thank you a lot again. Thank you.